The year is 1989. For the past few years, Turtles Fever has been captivating the children of planet Earth. The popularity of the kids' animated TV show would of course lead to all sorts of other fantastic merchandising opportunities, with video games being among them. Japanese company Konami would be tasked with developing video games for both the arcade and home market. The 1989 four-player arcade game received universal praise and proved so popular that it would be scaled back and ported to home formats the following year. But prior to this, there was just one Turtles game that could be played at home, which was for its first year a Nintendo Entertainment System exclusive. Like the majority of the most popular games developed for the NES, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would primarily function as a side-scrolling platform game, but would include a ton more additional mechanics making the game a lot more complex than what else was available on the market at the time. Gameplay starts out allowing the player to take control of Leonardo, where the player can explore a Legend of Zelda style top-down perspective overworld, and when the player enters buildings or sewers, players indulge in the game's core side-scrolling gameplay. Like in Mega Man, Castlevania and other side-scrollers, Leonardo has a health bar that depletes every time he collides with an enemy or projectile. He also has the ability to jump and swing his weapon to damage enemies. Stuff anyone would expect really. Interestingly though, throughout the game the player can switch a turtle out at will for another, each of which have their own independent life bars and unique weapons with varied reaches. On the NES, this style mechanic is heavily praised for its inclusion in the game, Little Samson. However, games such as Wonder Boy, The Dragon Trap for the Master System and this Turtles game are both early examples of this gameplay style. This mechanic means a player is only defeated by the game when all four turtles have been KO'd. The game follows the story of the turtles on a mission to retrieve the life transformer gun from Shredder, a device that could restore their sensei splinter back to his human form, but must rescue reporter April and Neil along the way, disarm a series of bombs as well as achieve a number of other feats on their way to their goal. Players must trek from location to location on the overworld screen, passing through side-scrolling sections when in many cases there are specific objectives such as obtaining a specific item to progress or defeating a boss. Most stages though the goal is simply to reach the exit. Along the way to assist players, pizza can be picked up to restore health, and specific sub-weapons can be discovered and used against enemies. So I guess all in all, this is more than a simple platformer, as it manages to mix up all sorts of gameplay elements. Thus far, we have only obviously really talked about the game on a very surface level, and we shall dive in deeper soon. But first, let's see what journalists thought of the game when it first popped up in 1989. What were writer's impressions? Nintendo Power were in love with this game, stating, The game is based on the characters created in Eastman and Laird's hit comic book of the same name, and will feature all of the fast action and crazy ninja tactics that you love in the comic book. One of the best things about this game is the superb play control in the action scenes, and the super sharp graphics. The game machine said, Initial playability is high. All the turtle sprites are well drawn and animated, and the bad guys present quite the challenge. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles is a very playable slash em up. I just hope that whoever is producing the home computer version hurries up. The publication known as Rays would shower the game with praise too, with the amusing journalist putting forward, I'm not quite the person that all the Ninja Turtle hype is aimed at. I'm almost 61, you know. But even I had a great time playing the NES version of the Fab Force Frolics. The difficulty factor is set just right, frustrating, but nothing to put your Nintendo in physical danger. The five action-packed levels are more than the average player can handle, but they just keep enticing you back for more. Computers and video games would highlight that the Turtles brand had become popular enough in Europe that Nintendo had decided to make the Turtles the packing game that came with the NES. After all, I guess that it did make sense considering the Turtles were hugely popular in Europe in 1990, whereas the NES itself had always failed to find a large audience. They would write, The Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles have certainly cowabungered their way into this issue with a vengeance. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles really is a super cartridge, and what's more, it's now being given away free with the console itself. Extremely good value, both for those who buy it, and those who get it for now. So, as you can see on this game's release, it was both a commercial and critical success, becoming one of the greatest selling games available on the NES. 
with the game being of a high enough quality to even impress adults, who did not give a crap about the children's animated show. So keeping all of this in mind, what went wrong that would change public perception regarding this game so drastically over the years? Let's go down this rabbit hole deeper. From what I can tell, looking at various sources on the Information Superhighway, on release many children found this game extremely difficult, and like with many other games of the period, would have to play it time and time again so that they could learn patterns and strategies to slowly get better at the game. People like myself who did not pick up this game until more recent years will be able to confirm how hard this game is simply to pick up and play. You will die time and time again very quickly, simply by not knowing what is coming next. There are so many ways to be picked off fast, including by being literally steamrolled as soon as you press start to play. This is a game you have to get good at and learn how to deal with problems in, in order to make any significant progress with. To be fair, everything I have just mentioned are tropes of the majority of home console games developed in the 1980s, so why did this game quickly attract an extra layer of salt from some people? Well, there are a few factors that contributed to this, before the game's re-emergence in the mid-2000s. Firstly, this was a game aimed at young children, and many found the mechanics involved with this game either confusing or even a bit broken, which we shall be discussing more on very shortly. Secondly, from everything I have been able to learn online, many children were unhappy with the selection of characters included in the game, such as a lot of kids were disappointed with the lack of the inclusion of Krang, one of the main antagonists from the animated TV show. What many small children would not have realised at the time though, is that there was more to the Turtles brand than the cartoon they watched on TV, and that that was only one telling of the story. Turtles was first a comic book series that began being published in 1984, three entire years before an animated show was even introduced. If you look at the game's box art, the art style used reflects the Turtles depiction from the original comic book, rather than the TV show, displaying each of the Turtles with the same red-coloured eye bandanas. The link to the comic books further explains Krang's lack of inclusion, as he was an additional character simply made up of the TV show, who was initially not included in the real Turtles source material. So at first where it may look like the developers were out of touch, no, the children were wrong. Weirdly though, this only seems to be partly the case. For example, once you actually start playing the game, the turtles feature the same coloured eye bandanas that they had in the cartoon. You will also notice that Rocksteady and Bebop are bosses in the game. Like Krang, both characters were designed specifically for the kids show. All of these characters would later appear in the Archie comics, a separate comic book series where they appeared in 1987, however Krang would not appear in it until December. So with one TV show and two comic books, there were three different turtle canons all around simultaneously, and it seems that the game is mainly based off the original comic, with maybe a few cartoon show elements implemented into the game, such as the bandanas in the late stages. But obviously this is just conjecture at this point. Either way, no Krang in the game certainly annoyed many children who loved the cartoon, the only turtles in their tiny minds. So there were a couple of reasons some people who grew up with the game would have been less fond of it than others, despite the game receiving a lot of very good reviews at launch. Many years later, on June 21st 2006, episode 5 of a show known as the Angry Nintendo Nerd would service online, which took a satirical look at the by then 17 years old Turtles NES game. The nerd would ridicule the game, referring to it as the most annoying game he had ever played, and stated the game was so bad that it sucks ass from a straw. In this amusing video, he would criticise many of the game's elements, even highlighting many particular moments that he deemed very annoying. From the characters beeping when they had low health, to the fact that Donatello was the only turtle worth playing as due to his superior reach. He acknowledges how easy it is to die in the game, including the steamroller on the overworld map I mentioned earlier. The video is basically 7 straight minutes of poking fun at the game, basically everything you would want in an episode from the man. There are a few famous scenes in the video which everyone remembers in relation to both this video and the Turtles game, including the game's water sections where you have to pass through the electrified weeds with a time limit, sections of the game where it appears to have convolted jumps, the inaccessible pizza, and the part where you can just walk over it. 
even the lack of Krang will be brought up in this video too. So this is a classic episode in James Rolfe's series that would act as a strong catalyst in the building of his own popularity. But it certainly did not do the 1989 Konami game any favours in terms of its reputation when it comes to its quality. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, this would not be the only time the game would be relevant in the noughties, as 2007 would see the game re-released in the Wii Shop, so anybody could purchase this game and add it to their collection once more. But as already stated earlier, journalists would tear this game a new asshole. Looking at some of these reviews from 2007, a lot of the complaints brought forward seem strikingly similar to those raised in the Nintendo Nerd satirical content. Nintendo Life would start their review by stating, Turtle Mania was sweeping the world when this came out in 1989. That's probably why this game was so popular, despite it being an unfair bag of dog droppings. The comparison to actual fecal matter sounds like the words of the nerd himself here, so his influence becomes immediately present. They would also echo that most of the turtles are not worth playing as due to their poor reach, and would claim the game was only ever popular due to the turtles branding and nothing else, which is amusing in contrast to all of the launch reviews I have read from adults who had never watched the turtles cartoon. Like the nerd, they would state that one slight mess up and you have to backtrack several screens, taking more and more damage. This just doesn't work in a game of this nature, it adds to the frustration factor. They would conclude with, don't let childhood nostalgia blind you to the flaws this game has. By all means, if you have fond memories of this from when you were a kid, download it, but don't say we didn't warn you. Unlike the Nintendo Life reviewer, the IGN writer who reviewed the game claims to have had the game in his own childhood, admitting to highly enjoying the game back then, but he too does complain that he was never happy with the lack of characters from the TV show in the game, which brings us back to the Krang obsession once again I guess. Like the nerd and Nintendo Life, he also writes that Leonardo's Katana Blade and Donatello's Bow are the only truly effective weapons in the game, and more often than not you will find yourself exploring the map with Michelangelo and Raphael simply because they are more dispensable. The IGN journalist concludes his piece with, I probably sound like a turtle hater. I actually really enjoyed this game as a kid, and even made it to the end, but upon revisiting the game over a decade later, it becomes increasingly apparent that the game is inherently flawed and simply doesn't stand the test of time. GameSpot, like other sources in 2007, would hate the game too, commenting that they felt it was absolutely insane that Konami had the audacity to charge $6 to play an old NES game but their general criticisms of the game would mainly fall in line with others from that year. From all of this I have to say the drastic shift between 1989 to 2007 from journalists thinking the game is amazing to in the future thinking it's absolutely dreadful is a ridiculous shift in opinion. Sure you would expect people to see the holes in a game as it ages like we often do with Goldeneye and uh, Mario 64 today for example but no one ever claims that these games are actually awful. It is generally acknowledged that they were amazing in their time, but rough around the edges today. I am surprised that journalists chose to give Turtles no slack whatsoever, and it makes me wonder how influenced they possibly would have been by James Rolfe's satirical work a year earlier. It is certainly an interesting scenario, because I cannot think of such a drastic change in opinion when it comes to many other games. For years past this point to some degree, I would say the internet hive mind thought of a Turtles game as a badly programmed title, that people only got enjoyment out of because it had the Turtles in it, and still liked it out of nostalgia. Whenever I brought up this game's poor reception in a video, I would always get people turn up and defend it. As recent as December last year, the Cinemassacre channel would release a brand new video on the game, one of which addressed how the game had been portrayed in that famous episode back in 2006. Mike Matai, who has always helped work on the Nerd series, mentions that he is sick of going around conventions defending the quality of the first Turtles game, a title that he feels he played a role in sullying the reputation of, due to helping produce that classic satirical video. He points out that the angry video game nerd is just a comedy show, and the game reviews are just a joke, even if some legitimate points are laced in between the content. 
This new video is an interesting 36 minute discussion on the game, breaking down many of the jokes and criticisms included in the original nerd video, and illustrating why if you was to review the game in a serious manner, that the criticism would simply not be fair. Like myself today, he addresses the game being an amalgamation of the comic book and the cartoon series, hence why it does not follow the canon of the TV show exactly, which is a criticism that is always brought up. He also attempts to debunk the Michelangelo and Raphael in the game both sucking, commenting that both the characters have the ability to one-hit certain enemies, and that switching between the turtles is about more than just Donatello's superior reach, which from my own personal research is not something 2007 journalists managed to get their heads around. Addressing some of the more famous moments in the nerd episodes, such as the unreachable pizza, sewer jump, and part in the warehouse where you had to just walk over it, they were all examples of good game programming, educating the player on the game's mechanics and nuances. The pizza was placed in an obviously unreachable place to encourage the player to run away from the jaws of life as quick as possible, and that the sewer jumping section and the warehouse walk over it bit taught players how to deal with certain obstacles in low risk environments where bad footing would not kill them, allowing them to utilise these same skills later on in a playthrough. The same goes for the steamroller one hit KO at the beginning too, as it does not matter if you die as soon as you begin, as you can reset but at least you know how dangerous the steamrollers actually are. He also brings up that if a player puts time into practicing the game that they will get better and learn the quickest route when dealing with the game's often criticised water section with the electrified plants. In my personal opinion, these plants are so hard to avoid as the programmers want players to use the turtle switching mechanic to further ensure players know how to effectively use that function. In terms of this difficult section, YouTuber John Riggs recently showed me an amusing video where he managed to swim through this treacherous section, but to do it he had to start from the same emulated save point an insane amount of times before he finally got there, even illustrating a trick to stop the flow of the current in the process. Now when it comes to the game's outrageous difficulty, Matai acknowledges that like many games of the era, it's about repetition, building knowledge and fast reflexes. However, there are also simple tricks you can pick up that make the experience far less challenging than many of the 2000 journalists tried to claim. On the surface, the ability to switch characters is clearly an important skill when it comes to getting through this game, but knowing which turtles are best to use against certain enemies and maximising the use of sub weapons such as boomerangs can also make the experience easier. More importantly, it seems that many people fail to pick up that the game is fairly easy to recover in when losing health, because you can consume pizza infinite times provided you exit and re-enter the room. It is not just a case of only enemies being able to respawn, like some would have you believe. Further to this, there is also a way of reviving KO Turtles 2, which not all gamers are aware of. Basically, buildings are located off the beaten track on the overworld map, where you can claim your fallen allies back, making the experience slightly easier. Regardless of any criticisms, there is no doubt that for a game from 1989, that Turtles has more depth than most of its platforming contemporaries from the era but this same complexity may have proved to be too much of a barrier for many people to even bother properly with the game, despite it having some of the most captivating music to complement this adventure available on NES hardware. In 2020, like many things Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the NES is a polarising game, with people often holding vastly different opinions with regards to this title's quality. In 1989, the game was beloved, in 2006 and 2007 the game was hated, and in 2020 I guess we have perhaps finally reached some sort of middle ground, which is probably the wisest position to be in with regards to this game. But at the end of the day, it's all a matter of opinion I suppose, but I hope at the very least this video gives you a little bit of historical context with regards to how many of these opinions were formed. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this game below. By now, you'll know the story of the rise of the Turtles franchise. The characters originated from a 1984 comic book series published by Mirage Studios, and they would go on to become mainstream superstars by 1987, after the franchise was successfully expanded into a cartoon series with accompanying toys and other merchandise. In this time frame, like any other popular kids TV show that held gravitas, the franchise would of course receive video games. The first of these would arrive in 1989, in both the arcade and the living room. 
This year, Nintendo's 8-bit home platform was dominating North America, so it would make sense that the Turtles would arrive on the Nintendo Entertainment System, on the Turtles' home soil. Thankfully, whilst this game was in development, Konami had an arcade game in the works simultaneously, that would deliver an experience in line with the quality of the rest of the Turtles franchise. These days, when it comes to Turtles games of the past, people are most likely to harp on about the quality of Turtles in time. But it would be the 1989 arcade game that would first lay the groundwork for the franchise within the beat-em-up genre. This arcade game, that used the animated TV series as the main source of material, is clearly extremely technically impressive considering how long ago this game was released. Graphically, it was arguably one of the finest looking beat-em-ups in the world upon release. Back in 1989, the Streets of Rage series was yet to exist at all. Golden Axe was in its infancy, and hardly any of the most famous Capcom and Konami beat-em-ups that helped define the genre had ever been released. Even Final Fight would not be released until this same year. So, all inspiration for this game could only be taken from more primitive titles in the medium, such as Double Dragon 2 The Revenge, possibly the greatest beat-em-up prior to 1989. So considering how early Turtles the Arcade game came out, it perhaps deserves a lot more credit with regards to the technically impressive experience it delivers. This title that was known as Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles in Europe and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Super Kamen Ninja in Japan could be played on a dedicated 4 player cabinet that obviously offered 4 player cooperative play. Since doing deep dives into games from this genre, this is the earliest game I have come across yet that offers such a feature, so yet another reason to be impressed with this game. Even if you have never played this one, it is not at all difficult to guess who the four playable characters are going to be. We have Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello and Rembrandt, so all four members of everyone's favourite group of superhero tortoises. Like in later Konami beat-em-ups, when it comes to four player versions of these cabinets, a different character is assigned to each control panel whereas characters are selectable when playing on a two-player cabinet. Controls in this game are simple and intuitive. Cabinets feature eight directional joysticks paired with two buttons which are predominantly used for jumping and attacking. Basically like all beat-em-ups that have been made up until this point so far. Combination inputs can be used though to throw enemies and perform different special attacks unique to each turtle. Characters can even perform wall jumps in specific areas and enemies can be smashed into these walls too. The game also features a range of smashable objects that can be damaged in order to help defeat nearby enemies. The turtles themselves, attack, speed and range also vary depending on which one you choose to play as. The game's introduction sequence along with the title's opening cutscene both feature the epic and iconic animated series theme tune, which has converted to the game so perfectly that I'm scared to play it for you here in case I get a copyright claim. The scene is simple and depicts the turtles giving chase after Shredder kidnaps April O'Neil. This sees the turtles heading into a burning building to rescue her as the first stage begins. Let's make some early observations here with regard to the game's overall design. The stage opens offering some great looking fire effects and foot soldiers to take out, some of which burst from behind the doorways in the background. If you have looked at a lot of beat-em-ups with me before, you may notice that in this game the sprites are smaller and less detailed than in the future Turtles in Time game. I would put this down to the fact that in the Double Dragon era of the genre, characters on screen were smaller, which offered them much wider movement range across the screen, but sprites seem to have been made bigger in later games in the genre, which seems to have been ushered in with Final Fight which arguably looked more visually impressive than many beat-em-ups that came before it. Also, after the success of the large sprites with huge attack varieties that were seen in Street Fighter 2, big sprites would become the in thing in most games that featured any kind of fighting at all. Turtles the arcade game seems to have been developed before this trend started though, making it probably the most visually impressive looking game out of all of the older, smaller sprite titles. In the game's first stage, players make their way through a burning hallway, fighting against different foot soldiers which come in a variety of different colours, whose attacks vary depending on their colour type. 
There are also demolition balls that fall from stairs, which the turtles must avoid, along with the wheeled robots who must also be defeated. April O'Neil can be found cowering in an office before a vehicle drills through the floor below, operated by Rocksteady, who acts as the game's first boss encounter. An easier opponent in the game who has a machine gun projectile attack. After his defeat, Shredder climbs out of the vehicle, stealing April O'Neil and escaping through one of the building's windows. This brings players onto stage 2, bringing the fight to the streets in a flurry of rage. Some enemy foot soldiers enter the scene via manholes on the stage floor, which is a nice nod early in the game to the accompanying TV show. It's also of note that this stage has some diagonal scrolling in the corner, years before this feature was implemented into Streets of Rage 2 which is clearly where Kashiro took that bit of influence from on one of the Mega Drive's most popular games. At the end of the stage, a boss fight takes place against a laser gun wielding Bebop, who also has a nice shoulder tackle attack and uppercut. The third stage occurs in the sewers, pulling the game even closer to its source material. A cool feature on this stage is that characters can fight on two planes, as they must jump to exit from the lower waterway. Rats can also be seen sometimes running past in the background to further deepen the aesthetics. Apart from the robot enemies and foot soldiers, spiky door barriers falling from below also act as damaging obstacles here. Stockman, a boss enemy who would later appear in the Hyperstone Heist, would also appear as the mid-boss on this stage for the first time, years before he become a lazy recycled asset on the Mega Drive platform. The stage is not quite over yet though, as the turtles appear to arrive in what looks like an underground car park, which is further illustrated by the rows of cars in the background. Some enemies also emerge from some of the parked vehicles, and in some cases some of these vehicles even pull out to try and kill the player. The bosses of this stage emerge from a lift as players face off against Rocksteady and Beatbop, this time simultaneously, as April watches on tied up on the lift floor. After rescuing April, players head towards the secret factory, fighting on a wide open road. On this huge open playing field, characters must avoid enemy traffic as they take down enemies. But it's the next portion of this stage which gets really cool. The next area is auto-scrolling as the turtles ride jet-powered skateboards whilst fighting against footmen in attack helicopters and enemies riding skateboards themselves. Again, we saw this feature implemented into future Turtles games, but it made its debut here, which was really innovative stage design within the beat-em-up genre. At this point in the game, you are now trying to save Splinter. The Turtles fight their way into the secret factory. Streets, sewers and factories are all tropes of beat-em-ups after all. Why would anyone want to design any other sort of stage? The stage area featured obligatory lasers that can hurt the player. But I'll give this game credit where credit is due, these tropes were at least less overused by only 1989. Aerial laser wielding robot enemies enter the fray on this stage too, causing further challenge for players. Splinter can be found strung up at the end of this stage, protected from rescue by the boss of the area, known as Granita, a huge powerful enemy who wields a flamethrower. Defeating him saves Splinter. Now the next stage is kind of funny to me, as I always joke that most beat-em-ups end with a Technodrome-like stage. Well, the next stage occurs aboard the Technodrome itself, for the first time in any game here, well, beat-em-up at least. So we are now witnessing the material that so many beat-em-ups draw their close influences from. This Death Star-like area is laden with gun turrets, lasers, barriers and the usual robots and foot soldiers players usually put up with. Everything is ramping up as the engine of the game forever draws closer. This stage even has an obligatory beat-em-up lift section as well. The boss of this area is Trag, another large gun-wielding opponent. Next, players must take on Krang, one of the Turtles' animated series' main antagonists, offering great fan appeal for viewers of the show. After defeating Krang, he escapes from the Technodrome, leaving only Shredder left to fight. Shredder attacks with a sword and lightning bolts from a device on his helmet. That demutates the Turtles, killing them instantly. He is also able to create clones of himself. In fact, the exact number of clones is one more than the number of turtles attacking him in the arcade version. When Shredder, or one of his clones, nears defeat, his helmet falls off, which is a unique occurrence in the entire game series. 
Defeating him brings the game to a close, showing the wreckage of the Technodrome before the end credits finally roll. In 1989, this excellent game offered both Turtles and beat-em-up fans alike everything they could have possibly wanted in a video game. The gameplay to the stage design and the music was all spot on. In fact, it delivered everything to consumers that the 1989 game on the NES failed to deliver previously. So, keeping all of this in mind, it is no surprise at all that it would not be too long before home versions of this game would start to surface. The issue was though that despite games like Turtles Arcade existing, many consumers in the home were still playing their games on extremely dated hardware. The first port of the game would be ready in 1990, which would be released on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The issue was that by this point, the Japanese Famicom was six years old, and much better hardware existed, such as the Sega Mega Drive and Turbo Graphics, for example. But sadly, the majority of Americans were still choosing to play on the tacky old NES at this point, offering games that did not look anything at all like games found in the arcade. So the problem was that in the Turtles' biggest market, North America, the NES was sadly dominant, so Konami's hand was forced for them to work on a port of the game to a system with extremely limited capabilities. It turned out though, what looked to be impossible was actually semi-achievable, and the software developers would manage to make a decent port of the game even if it was lacking compared to the original. For a platform as limited as the NES, this game titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, is a very decent effort. Impressively, not only is not that much left out in this impressive title, but the game even introduced a range of additional features too, which even spread as far as additional stages. Wow. Amongst these is a snow-themed stage, featuring snow enemies and a boss fight against Polar Bear. But there is also a fight against Natman, preventing Rock's Daddy and Bebop being used twice. There was an entire Shogun themed stage with a mid boss fight that takes place against Paper Tiger, and a main boss battle against Shogun, and so much more. Serious effort seems to have been made by Konami to give consumers the best experience possible on old 8 bit hardware. Not only is most of the game faithfully recreated in 8 bit, but there are so many new stages to play through and enjoy too, offering gamers a longer experience than with the title's arcade counterpart. I am surprisingly impressed, a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Now, when it came to being able to sell home conversions of this game to consumers, whilst the NES and its limited capabilities would have caused a lot of tweaking to be applied to get the game home to most American consumers, the Turtles' other huge market, Europe, would cause a different barrier for Konami. In Europe's case, unlike North America, one platform did not dominate. Instead, there was a lot more diversity in the marketplace with a variety of different systems meeting consumers' needs. In fact, Nintendo massively botched the launch of the NES in Europe, and as a result the platform never really caught on. Only in Norway and a few other North European countries was the platform dominant at all, and that was due to the methods of a bullish salesman known as O. Bergsten rather than Nintendo themselves, but that's a whole story for another time. Instead, for Konami to conquer Europe with the Turtles brand, the game would need to be ported to a range of different home computer formats. Considering all of these platforms were so different, achieving quality in this area was no easy feat, so the arcade game was released by Imageworks and ported by Probe Software in 1991 for the ZX Spectrum, Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, PC and Commodore 64. None of these ports have the same impact as the NES version, mostly down to the fact that the same amount of resources were never poured into any of them, as one would expect really. British Gamer Magazine The One reviewed the home computer versions of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles under of course the British title of Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, calling it a pretty poor interpretation of a pretty poor yet popular subject. 
every one of the levels is too easy to guarantee more than a week's interest, particularly because the opponent's intelligence is so predictable and your own moves so limited. Forgetting about the poor home computer versions of the game, the original arcade version of the game was one of the most impressive beat-em-ups around at the game's time of release and would have been one of the best games to play in the genre, whether it had been a Turtles game or not. The NES version too is extremely impressive, considering the limitations porting the game to such hardware would have presented Konami with, so a great effort in both cases in my opinion. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, known as the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles in my region in the 80s and 90s, was a cultural phenomenon, and was the fidget spinners of its day in terms of popularity with the kids. Toys and merchandise was literally bloody everywhere. And the franchise seemed to be the most popular kids show on television since the likes of Transformers and Ghostbusters. Now, this is where Turtles game history gets a tad confusing. The world would get multiple Game Boy games, a DOS game, a pinball game and even a colouring game for the home micros. The next blockbuster game though would arrive in the arcades in 1991. This would be the fantastic Konami beat em up and the most loved Turtles game of all time, Konami's Turtles in Time. Despite this being only the second Turtles arcade game and the third mainline Turtles game overall, amusingly it would be named Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 when it arrived on the Super Nintendo in the next year of 1992. The reason for this was because in between the arcade release and SNES port of Turtles in Time, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project would be released, a title that would arrive on the Nintendo Entertainment System and would appear to utilise the same game engine as Turtles 2 for the platform. So now we have chronologically examined how we got here, before we look at the Super Nintendo version of Turtles in Time, let's focus on what made the arcade version of this game so great. The game features a short introductory cutscene detailing the game's plot. The Turtles are watching a TV newscast that is being reported by April O'Neil. Krang flies in using a giant exosuit and steals the Statue of Liberty before Shredder hijacks the airwaves to laugh at the Turtles. This extremely simple scene establishes a basic story for the game ahead. Just like the first Turtles arcade game, Turtles in Time was released in the arcades with two distinct style cabinets. One that allowed two players at a time to play this side-scrolling beat-em-up and another cabinet that let up to four players jump in on the action. In this same time frame, Konami would also release four player X Men and Simpsons beat em ups, which are just as well liked as this Turtles game. Titles which I can only assume were designed to run in the same engine, bearing in mind how similar these three games are. In the two player version of this game, on the player select screen, the player gets to choose which one of the four Turtles they wish to control. However, in the four player version of this title, each of the four characters are assigned to an individual control panel each. Leonardo Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo and Rembrandt are all playable. Whilst the four turtles themselves all look very similar, like the TV show they have differing weapons and in this game they each have their own unique strengths and weaknesses. During the combat in the game, characters have the ability to execute more powerful attacks by hitting an enemy multiple times in a row. They also have the capacity to pick up and throw enemies into surrounding groups of enemies. In terms of controlling the turtles, the control scheme is basically the same as the previous arcade game and other Konami beat em ups that we touched on earlier. The cabinets feature extremely simplistic button layouts. Joysticks are present for movement, but each player only has access to a simple two button layout, one for jumping and one for attacking. Two button layouts are nothing new to the genre, and the very successful Final Fight that released just a few years earlier gave players the same number of buttons to utilise too. I feel Turtles in Time and the other Konami beat em ups though probably give the player a wider range of attacks and movement ranges as the turtles can run, perform a slide or dash attack, jump higher, perform a stationary or directed air attack, as well as the ability to perform special moves. Sure it isn't the most intuitive, innovative control scheme, but it gets the job done and helps deliver the pick up and play experience you would expect from games heavily targeted towards children. Turtles, X-Men and Simpsons were all franchises primarily aimed at appealing to that demo. The opening stage of the Turtles game takes place in New York City on the most stereotypical stage you could possibly expect from a 1991 beat-em-up. Stylistically, the stage looks very similar to stages found both within Final Fight and the first two Streets of Rage games. I guess the inspiration in the genre generated by the 1987 movie, Streets of Fire, just simply wasn't dying down, leading to some very samey level designs across the whole field. 
On this first stage, waves of enemies come in the form of foot soldiers. Touching back on the combat again, I think it's a nice innovative touch that the player can throw their opponents towards the screen, creating an illusion of fighting on more than just a two-dimensional plane. This is nice because, apart from delivering an extra layer of depth, the mechanic is cartoony and ridiculous, so absolutely perfect for a game based on a children's cartoon. Energy bars can also be refilled in the game by picking up pizza, another nice feature that echoes back to the property the game is based on. Apart from the enemies, additional threats come in the form of the wrecking balls placed throughout the stage, meaning players have to think slightly more about where they position their characters than within many other beat-em-ups. Throughout the stage, there are also exploding barrels and cranging the exosuit makes an appearance to shoot lasers from the suit's eyes, creating further obstacles for the character to dodge away from rather than just regular enemy attacks. Every stage of the game contains the classic beat em up trope of facing off against a boss at the end of each one. The first stage, known simply as the Big Apple, finds the turtles facing off with Baxter, an enemy that varies from others on the stage in that he must be combated and defeated in midair. Stage 2, known as Alley Cat Blues, takes place in an area featuring lots of rundown graffiti covered buildings in which enemies exit from to take you on. Once again, we have seen this exact style stage in both Final. Fight and Streets of Rage before, but nothing new to the genre in terms of scenery. The stage probably has more detail in this one though. There are leaky fire hydrants present, rubbish fields skipped, and enemies that jump onto the screen from stairwells above. In fact, enemies are attacking from all sorts of angles, including from jumping from behind fences. There are also varied palette swaps of foot soldiers to take down in this one, and completely new enemies to the game in the form of boxing glove wielding robots. The boss battle takes place against Metalhead, a robotic version of the turtle. Turtles. The boss ups the level of challenge in comparison to the previous one by using a mix of both ground and aerial based manoeuvres. The next stage takes place in the sewers, a location obviously synonymous with the Turtles franchise. The first Turtles arcade game features a stage where combat takes place whilst riding a skateboard. This same mechanic is taken and re-implemented into the sewer stage here, switching the skateboard out for a surfboard. The presence of the surfboards means that this level is auto-scrolling and the player must fight opponents and dodge obstacles as quickly as they appear on the screen. Pace and movement on this stage is quicker than previous levels. After another boss battle that isn't too challenging, a cutscene occurs where a signal from Shredder appears, banishing the turtles 25 million years back in time, meaning the turtles get to time travel, hence the name Turtles in Time. Stage 4 that feels like a stage we would find when playing Cadillacs and Dinosaurs takes place in the forest, and foot soldiers descend from above being carried by pterodactyls. These airborne dinos also drop projectiles from above, triggering memories of the annoying birds in Mega Man. As you progress through the stage, you also encounter rock soldiers, who are a bit more sturdy than the regular foot soldiers. The stage backdrop and foreground transitions quickly from an area filled with vegetation to a volcanic molten lava ridden area. The boss fight takes place against one of the game's tougher opponents, in which the key to victory is managing to get behind them. After achieving victory, the turtles are transported through time once again to 1530 AD through to a stage known as Skull and Crossbones, which takes place aboard a pirate ship. This short stage is full of reoccurring established enemies, and is followed up with a boss fight against Toka and Razor. This is the first time in the game the player is forced to face off against two boss characters at once. The key strategy in achieving victory in such an encounter is to focus all of your efforts into taking one out at a time. The characters are then transported to 1885 to a stage that takes place on the back of a moving goods train. The level is designed the same as the boat stage in Streets of Rage and the train stage in Final Fight in that the background scrolls at a brisk pace whilst the ground below the plan moves in order to create the illusion of a moving vehicle. The stage has some enemies entering the fray on horseback which conjures memories of Sunset Riders, a game that was released the same year as this one. After getting through a boss of this stage, we travel in time once again to the futuristic year of 2020. Woohoo! The stage starts out like the sewer surfing stage, only the surfboards have been switched out for hoverboards. Because, as you will be aware, flying hoverboards have existed for several years by now. Films set at a way earlier date than 2020 featured them after all. The boss battle of the stage finally culminates in an encounter with Krang in the exosuit. 
Once defeated him, the characters are transported to the even more futuristic year of 2100. A year I can guarantee that in real life still won't feature hoverboards. Nor will we ever have built a space civilization either, like what this title suggests. We will be lucky to even get gained with shorter load times by this period in my opinion. I am not sure why story writers always choose such close years in these games. The year 100,000 would make this all a little more believable I think. As expected in this Death Star like stage you fight for a range of opponents including lots of foot soldiers and multiple robot like enemies who debut on the level. In the final throws of a game you must face off against Krang once more, this time without his exosuit. Then the player is walked back in time to the tubular year of 1991 to face off in a final encounter with Shredder. In regards to this part of the game, I thought it was a nice touch to place the Statue of Liberty in the background, as it brings the narrative of the game full circle. Just before the game's credits, a final cutscene occurs showing a news report of our heroes returning the lost statue, once again to make America great again. Yeah. The original arcade version of this game is an impressive one featuring great music, bright cartoony graphics and art that jumps out of the screen and a simple yet effective control layout that anyone could learn and master. In terms of non-gaming franchises, Konami knocked it out of the park with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in Time in the arcades. In regards to this, following the game's arcade release, Turtles in Time became Konami's best selling arcade title. Critics would find that although this title was largely similar to the previous Turtles arcade game, they felt that it was a net improvement over its predecessor on all points, including graphics, music and gameplay. Overall the game was hailed for staying true to its source material, which certainly cannot be said for many games based on TV shows. Konami did a top notch job here. So that was the arcade game, but what about the home conversion on the SNES? Did the Super Nintendo bring the arcade experience home? Let us explore this further. Straight away when looking at the first stage of the game, the number of enemies on screen appearing at once in the title has been significantly reduced from that of the game's arcade counterpart. The sizes of all the sprites in the game are also smaller, less detailed and feature less animation frames than in the arcade version, in a move that is similar to when you compare the arcade and Super Nintendo versions of say, Street Fighter 2. The game is still good but nowhere near as impressive as the title found in cabinets. The game has also been reduced from a 4 player title down to cater to a maximum of just 2 players at a time. In fact, the more I look at this game alongside its arcade counterpart, the more I notice it has been scaled back, and none of the backgrounds feature the same level of detail neither. Positive changes though is that I noticed stage 3 in the series is a different boss, which is a nice touch as the previous boss was just a large number of recurring enemies who featured earlier in the stage, so good to see a positive change rather than scaling back in some way. Stage 4 though brings the most impressive addition yet, an entire new bloody stage, in the form of a techno drone. This is a mechanical themed level featuring lots of robotic enemies and foot soldiers. Surprisingly the middle of the stage presents a mid boss fight against Toka and Razor, a boss encounter that does not appear until much later in the game in the arcade version. The next portion of the stage features the player ascending the lift taking on enemies, a trope found in a number of beat em ups that was missing from the arcade version of this title. The end of the stage includes a really interesting battle where you must take out enemies whilst Shredder shoots projectiles at you from an overhead perspective. The developers put a lot of effort into this additional stage. The boss at the end of the prehistoric stage has also been changed. The bosses from the Skull and Crossbones stage appears as mid-level bosses in the new Technodrome level, so the pirate themed level now features a fight with Rocksteady and Bebop dressed as pirates, a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. The Western Train stage features no significant changes, but moving on just prior to travelling to the future, the player gets to indulge in a brand new stage which utilises the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 abilities to create a very F-Zero looking environment. This stage ends with a confrontation with Krang, just like on the alternative stage found in the game's arcade counterpart, which is also set in 2020. Ooh. Star Killer Base, I mean Star Base, is once again the final stage for the game, where you face off against Krang at the end, then finally against Shredder. Although, to be fair, the Shredder fight is slightly different, as at this time Shredder transforms into Kevin Nash. 
So that was the SNES port of the game. The Super Nintendo was not capable of providing the same level of detail and finesse in terms of time than what could be found in the arcade. The game features less detail, less animation, less enemies on screen at once, and the four player feature is reduced down to two. However, in many ways, Konami made up for the port's shortcomings by including new stages and boss encounters whilst cutting as little content as possible from the game. Overall, I guess the game is a very strong port considering the hardware limitations of the Super Nintendo. In terms of the game's reception at the time, the SNES version was praised for its additional stages and gameplay modes by critics. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it a unanimous score of 9 out of 10, applauding the fun gameplay, the new moves, the accurate recreation of the arcade version's graphics and the two-player versus mode, though they criticised the game is a bit too easy. All game lauded the conversion for its visuals, which replicate the cartoon's art style. The game's music and sound effects were also praised. Nintendo Jo called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time the best Ninja Turtles game of all time. Entertainment Weekly wrote that the turtles may have peaked on the big screen, but in video game land, they're just reaching their potential. Something I loved about about Turtles in Time in terms of the stages and graphics is just how cartoony and close to the source material the game looks, and the amount of obstacles that occur on various stages really mixes things up from simply dealing with wave after wave of enemies. The controls in Turtles in Time really complement the gameplay, and are absolutely perfect for a game that must have been targeted towards attracting a child audience. The game's simple attack and jump two button layout functions great, and even allows for special moves, jump kicks and more. Combat can be really mixed up sometimes and the game offers a lot of variety in that some of the stages include riding surf and hoverboards, offering a more varied gameplay experience in some ways than even that of which can be found in Streets of Rage 2. Turtles in Time is a bloody good game which features one of the best visual art styles in the entirety of the Super Nintendo's library and some of the most varied looking stages and unique bosses in the entire beat em up genre. Turtles in Time really is a brilliant game and is simply one of the greatest 16-bit games ever made. But the classic Turtles video game story was far from over yet. A fourth Turtles game would see release in December of 1991 known as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project, with Turtles in Time's name later being changed to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time, with the justification being that it was the fourth Turtles game to see a release on Nintendo Living Room Hardware, as the series gets even more chronologically confusing if we bring the Game Boy games into the mix too. So to make things clear, the Manhattan Project was the third Turtles game to arrive on the NES, but various other Turtles games existed in the arcades, on handhelds and even home computers. The whole thing is a mess unless you somehow manage to stay inside a Nintendo Entertainment System bubble. One final note to make matters even more confusing, the bloody Famicom version of this game is known as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Manhattan Project. So, yes, chronologically confusing as I said. So, let's now see how this Turtles NES exclusive holds up today, and whether or not it delivered a worthy experience. Now the best way to explain how this game functions is that it basically looks and feels and plays like a direct extension of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 for the system, in that it offers the same style graphics and controls but gives players an entire new story to experience and levels to play through. There are some minor changes to the gameplay though, for example Turtles can now perform a toss attack when players hold the D-pad downwards and press B. Like in the classic Turtles arcade game, players can perform a different special attack each, giving Rembrandt and his companions a little bit of diversity. Like its NES predecessor, two-player co-op makes the return, automatically making this game a better purchase than Final Fight for the Super Nintendo. Interestingly, two-player mode is customizable, giving players the option to be able to damage the other, whilst also the ability to disable this feature which personally I would recommend as I see no advantage of being able to hurt your own partner. Bloody weird really. Like in other Turtles games, this one opens up by showing a few slides to establish the game's story. In the Manhattan Project case, the game begins with the Turtles spending their vacation in Key West, Florida. 
While watching April O'Neil's latest news report, her broadcast is suddenly hijacked by the turtle's nemesis, Shredder. Taking April as his hostage, Shredder reveals that he has also turned the entire borough of Manhattan into a floating island and challenges the turtles to come to his lair to stop him. So from here, the turtles set out on an adventure, broiling their way through eight varied stages. So from here, let's look at what can be experienced during one of these playthroughs. The first stage takes place on a Florida beach, with foot soldiers aplenty to take out. Just like in all previous Turtles beat-em-ups, although sadly, like of all games that were manufactured by this gimped piece of hardware, Sprite Flicker is pretty terrible in this game. But we can't really expect anything else when it comes to games made to run on such a system. In the later part of the stage, players seem to reach a pier with multiple signs indicating that the Turtles are in Key West. There is even a downward scrolling section in this stage, which is pretty impressive to see in the NES game. A simple boss fight takes place against Rocksteady at the end of the stage, who wields a harpoon weapon in this entry of the series. The following stage sees the Turtles ride waves to Manhattan, in a stage that features some great graphics for the basic 8-bit system. Although I must say I do find it amusing seeing foot soldiers jump out of the water like Free Bloody Willy which I am going to assume must happen due to the fact that it would have taken up more space having a different enemy jump out of the water. A foot soldier can fire lasers from an aerial vehicle must also be defeated to bring players to the second half of this stage that takes place aboard a mechanical platform. Here our players must avoid and destroy mechanical turrets that pop up out of the ground along with the usual foot soldiers. As players progress, enemies start appearing from doorways and more variants of foot soldiers wielding different weapons begin to show up too. The boss fight takes place against Ground Chuck, who has a tackle attack just like Rocksteady, but can swing his large weapon as well. The next stage takes place on the Red Bridge, another stage trope which I often comment on as it usually appears in a lot of beat-em-ups. Like other titles, there are holes here to avoid and more enemy sprites start showing up from previous Turtles games, including the large demolition balls, if they can be classed as enemies too. Bebop also tries to run you down in his vehicle in the opening section of this stage. A mid-boss fight on this level takes place against Slash, making his 8-bit debut here. After this, players must continue along the bridge taking out foot soldier after foot soldier, before finally taking on Bebop who can perform a kick and a projectile attack. Stage 4 sees players arrive on the floating Manhattan Island, where combat commences in a very final fight slash streets of rage like setting literal fight number streets. There are even more downward scrolling sections found here too. There are some nice graphical effects to be seen such as foot soldiers jumping through windows, smashing them in the process. Players then fight enemies through a park section, then back into another street, before descending into an underground. This area even sees a train pull up, which is once again reminiscent of Final Fight. Pretty impressive for the NES. The boss fight in this area takes place against Dirtbag, which I must say is a great name for a villain. In stage 5, players enter a sewer area, as what would be a Turtles game without entering the sewers after all. In this very Turtle stage, the area impressively scrolls in all sorts of directions, as you take on foot soldiers and other enemies that jump and attack from every opening imaginable. This is perhaps the most interesting stage of a game has offered yet, which is a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one, considering that you would just expect a standard side-scrolling sewer. A mid-boss fight takes place against a foot soldier riding a mechanical steed, until players make it to Leatherhead, a character who had previously appeared as a boss in Turtles in Time, but he does have a different attack pattern here, performing mostly tail whips. Stage 6 sees players arriving in the iconic Technodrome, a vehicle that often serves as an end area for many Turtles games. Once inside this Death Star ripoff, players must take on robots, foot soldiers and other enemies as the difficulty continues to ramp up. There are lasers and conveyor belts and all sorts that must be contended with. Later in the stage, players must fight Razor, a scratchy opponent who also has the ability to freeze the Turtles on the spot. Directly after this, players take on Shredder, the Turtles arch nemesis. April can also be seen throughout this fight, tied up at the top of the screen. Considering he is a main villain, he does not prove too challenging. 
Upon his defeat and April's rescue, sadly, he escapes to Crank's spaceship above Manhattan. This brings us to stage 7, which starts up by offering a classic beat em up lift section, because as I comment every single week, it must have been illegal to program a beat em up without including the stage exactly like this. I have to say though, I do love the sunset over Manhattan in this one. Getting through the section brings the turtles atop a skyscraper, with some enemies arriving via helicopter-like vehicles. Up here, players must take on Toka in a boss battle before finally progressing to the final stage. Aboard Krang's spaceship, everything is thrown at the player in these literal final throws of the game. Once again, as expected, this stage is very Technodrome-like in appearance, with more enemies and obstacles showing up as the players move forward. This is by far both the longest and most challenging stage in the game. Eventually though, players end up in a confrontation with Krang, who has the ability to fight the turtles by having his robot legs detached from his robotic body. Once he is defeated, Krang escapes, leaving players with one final challenge. Players are confronted with Shredder, who manages to transform into Kevin Nash. Unlike in real life, Kevin Nash has an attack pattern which is more varied than any foe, but after fighting him for, say, a couple of minutes, his quads give out, bringing an end to this game. Congratulations. So, in regards to this whole game, apart from a lot of flicker, and all the usual conventions that weaken NES titles, for the hardware, this is a pretty impressive game, delivering an experience that, in my opinion, tops Turtles 2 for the system, in pretty much every category. I am impressed with the amount of work it appears that Konami put into this game, with various technical feats being included that show off that the game is far more than just a ROM hack of Turtles 2. In fact, looking at this game, it is a bit sad really that a 16-bit looking version of the title was not released for other hardware, as this game could have been obviously even better if a version was made for a more powerful system. But when you consider the limitations, the Manhattan Project is great. I might even go as far as claiming that this might just be the greatest beat-em-up that NES has to offer. It is very, very impressive. So, all in all, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project is a welcome entry within the library of Turtles games from the classic era, and stands out from the pack as relevant by being possibly the best console exclusive game that was not simply a port of a previous arcade game. So the game possibly needs a bit more recognition for that alone. If you were a person born in the mid 80s or earlier, you'll certainly be able to remember how ridiculously popular Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was. Just like any popular kids TV show of the period, this would of course be translated into all sorts of other merchandise and entertainment mediums, with video games being an obvious source of income for the franchise. There would be many Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games, but it would be March 1991 that would see the release of a game that some consider to be the magnum opus of the series. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time would be a fantastic side-scrolling 4-player beat-em-up by Konami, topping all of the Turtles games that had come before it as a true all-time gaming classic. Just a short few months later, the game would arrive home on the Super Nintendo, and although this version of the game only offered two-player cooperative play, many fans of the game cite this version as being even better due to the fantastic new stages and bosses that were added into the arguably more refined version of the title. Not often is a home version of an arcade game better, but a strong case can be made for this title to have achieved this feat. It would not be until December 1992 that the Sega Mega Drive would receive a Turtles game, and interestingly, it would be completely different to what had appeared in the arcades previously. The game is supposedly completely different due to, at this point in time, both Konami and Capcom having exclusivity deals with Nintendo, which is why games like Turtles in Time and the original incarnation of Street Fighter 2 both never made it over to the platform, so a completely different Turtles game would be a way of circumventing this problem. Besides, Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo employed a lot of Mode 7 graphical effects, particularly in the new sections that were bespoke for the hardware, so a game more orientated for the Mega Drive hardware would be nice anyway. 
Upon starting a playthrough of this game, it is instantly easy to see why people confuse this game with Turtles in Time. The player select screen looks the same, and the game's introduction is very similar. Like Turtles in Time, the game starts out with April O'Neil reporting in front of the Statue of Liberty. Only this time around, instead of just stealing the statue, Shredder shrinks the entirety of Manhattan, instantly differentiating the game's stories for those who have played both Turtles games. The Turtles watch all of this unfolding on a television screen as Shredder announces to the world that he was responsible for the act and achieved this feat through the use of Dimension X's Hyperstone. This scene establishes the narrative of the game and gives the reason for the Turtles to set out on an adventure to restore Manhattan to its true size. The first stage takes place underground in what appears to be sewers, a location that is synonymous with the Turtles franchise. Once again, if you have played Turtles in Time, you will notice that this stage is completely different to anywhere that appeared in that game. But the Turtles sprite animations, along with the foot soldier enemies, are identical to the ones found in the Super Nintendo game, straight away suggesting that Hyperstone Heist is a game that was created recycling many of the assets straight from the Turtles in Time game. But which of the two is better? Let's keep looking at the game to work out the answer. Players will also notice that the characters control the same. Pizza can be picked up and used to replenish health once again. And soon the wheeled robots from the Turtles in Time resurface on the opening stage too. The latter part of the opening stage finds the Turtles fighting their way through the streets of New York. Parts of this stage, including the backdrops, are identical to some of those found in the second stage of the Turtles SNES game. Like that level 2, this stage also has water spouting fire hydrants, but there are some completely new obstacles too, for example cars that can now run the player over. Still, there are enough similarities here to further explain why so many gamers get confused in believing that this game is a port of the arcade classic. Past this point, the first stage continues through another sewer, this time though in an area which is slightly more waterlogged. There are foot soldiers down here aplenty in a variety of different pallet swaps. During this part of the stage, another familiar enemy resurfaces, the alien-like enemy who had appeared previously in the sewer surfing stage in the arcade game. The boss fight of the stage occurs against Leatherhead, a boss who is yet another recycled asset, previously appearing in the western-themed Back to the Future 3-like level of the time-travelling Turtles game. The next stage, known as the Mysterious Ghost Ship, sees the turtles surfing across the open sea. The stage itself is new, but the mechanic is one again which has been recycled from the earlier game. There are some robotic flying enemies on this stage of O2 that I never recall seeing before. After this, the character arrives on the ghost ship itself, which to be fair does look quite different from the ship stage that appeared in Turtles in Time which we are simply going to refer to as TIT going forward for simplicity. There is a painting of Shredder hanging on the wall on this stage, and the sky in which we can see, through holes in the sides of the boat, is an eerie shade of purple. Ooh, spooky. The stage also features wooden barrels to dodge, as what would be a beat-em-up or fighting game without barrels, eh? Apart from just foot soldiers, even more familiar enemies from TIT arrive. Still on the same stage, the turtles finally reach ashore, stepping off of the vessel and into a cave. Enemy sprites, crates of dynamite and falling stalactites can all of course cause a hindrance for the player when traversing through the level. A boss battle eventually occurs against Rocksteady. Whilst Rocksteady appeared in the previous game, last time he had fought alongside Bebop, and this time is at least wearing different clothes. He does not come up with much of a challenge for players. Moving into stage 3, or scene 3 as the game likes to call it, the player leaves the cave and apparently heads towards Shredder's hideout. The stage is laden with multiple familiar enemies as the turtles head past a very eastern orientated looking building. Eastern orientated? The Orient? See what I did there? The inside of this building comes with all sorts of traps and obstacles and suddenly you may be starting to feel like you are playing a Gambit Goemon title another great series of games developed by Konami. 
Whilst many of the obstacles appear old fashioned, there is even the old laser to dodge here and there. The boss fight takes place against a powerful human foe known as Tatsu, the first completely new boss character the game has introduced thus far. He has a range of projectile attacks and is proved tough to beat due to the onslaught of foot soldiers the player must take down simultaneously. Scene 4, known as the Gauntlet, takes place in yet another boring looking cave. This time however with a water covered floor so that the programmers could use for alien like enemies once again. Early in the stage the player faces off with a pallet swap version of Leatherhead, quickly suggesting that a gauntlet is going to occur against all three of the game's bosses. Assumptions would be correct, as Pallet Swap Rocksteady is up next, followed by Pallet Swap Tatsu. After these three bosses, the stage's true boss is revealed, an encounter against an airborne stockman opponent, who unleashes hordes of robots against the player. The very end of the stage reveals the Technodrome, the location of the next stage. The Technodrome features a lot of recycled elements from the Technodrome themed stage within Tit, including the return of familiar obstacles. Halfway through the stage, a boss fight occurs against Krang, once again a boss from the Tit game. We then enter an elevator section, once again something we received in Tit and a trope that seems to occur in every beat em up that's ever been made. Eventually, when reaching the bottom of this shaft, a boss fight occurs against Super Shredder, the same final boss from the Turtles in Time game. After a tough battle, defeating him finally restores Manhattan to normal, queuing the end credits and restoring the universe of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles back to normal once again. So that was a quick look at every stage, an important part of the Hyperstone heist. So now we have seen it all, let us try and summarise the differences with the Turtles in Time game and try and conclude once and for all which of the two entries is a better game. Looking at the two games, it is very clear that many elements of the Hyperstone heist were shamelessly recycled from Tit, almost in a heist-like fashion, making it abundantly clear that Konami must have assumed that the majority of consumers would not buy both games, which makes sense I suppose considering not many people owned more than one console of the generation at the time back then. Due to this vast amount of recycling, it is easy to see why some people think the two titles are both the same game, or in even worse cases, why some even mistake the game as a butchered port of the arcade version. Analyzing the Hyperstone heist properly though, the game has plenty of unique elements including mostly new stages, a completely different story and many new bosses. The title is certainly a different game altogether. But which of the two titles is better? Many write off Hyperstone Heist instantly due to the recycled nature of many of the game's assets, especially if the players have already experienced the arcade game. But if you try and look at the Mega Drive game completely isolated to what came before it, it's a very decent title. It is a great beat em up with probably only some of the Streets of Rage games being better options on the Sega platform. The Hyperstone Heist is simply that good but it is difficult to put on the same platform as Turtles in Time due to the following reasons. Firstly, the two games lengths. Tit appears to be a longer game than that of Hyperstone Heist, with a lot more stages and a lot more variety. The story narrative of travelling through time leads to a lot of environmental changes as you progress through the arcade and Super Nintendo classic. The Super Nintendo version of the game mixes the title up even further too by adding all of the fantastic extra levels and utilising the advantages of Mode 7. Turtles in Time is a really special game. The Hypestone Heist, although very decent in its own right, provides all of these elements, just in much smaller doses. Which is kind of amusing really, considering that the actual narrative story of the game is about shrinking Manhattan. The title does feel like a smaller and less epic experience. Still though, the amount of new stages and bosses ensure that the Hyperstone Heist is still worth a playthrough, whether you have completed Turtles in Time or not. So although I do not believe that the game is the best in the series, it is certainly a game that beat em up fans should play, even if you just want to look at what has been done differently this time around. 
Both Turtles in Time and the Hyperstone Heist come from an interesting period in gaming, where the same developer would release titles representing the same franchises in completely different forms, depending on the hardware. If only the console war between the Xbox One and PS4 had offered us all the same kind of diversity, eh? Then we would have actually had reasons to play on them. So, to conclude, Turtles in Time is better, but the Hyperstone Heist is a game that still deserves your attention, so make sure you don't pass it up. As pretty much everyone of a certain age in the world knows, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were a worldwide cultural phenomenon, just like Star Wars, He-Man, Transformers and Ghostbusters before it. The Turtles had their own empire. TV shows, movies, toys, lunchboxes, you name it, Turtles had it. Prior to all of this though, the Turtles first existed in the form of a comic book series, published by Mirage Studios way back in 1984. An important factoid that will soon feed into the rest of this video. Speaking of the Turtles Empire, this would too obviously include a whole range of video games, with the most successful of these being side-scrolling beat-em-ups. 1992 would see Turtles in Time ported from the arcade over to the Super Nintendo, whereas the Sega Mega Drive would get its own exclusive beat-em-up, the Hyperstone Heist, two games that are considered amongst the very best on their two respective platforms. By the following year of 1993, children had had the heroes in a house shell in their lives for quite some time. By this point in time, the Mirage comic book series had launched an entire nine years earlier, and even the popular children's cartoon was six years old. Obviously, six years is a tremendous amount of time in a child's life, so some of the audience who had grown up watching the show had either grown out of the show, or were beginning to latch on to the emerging Mighty Morphin Power Rangers craze. Still though, despite a decline in popularity, it still seemed like there was some life in the green brand, with a proportion of Turtles loyalists still highly interested in the franchise. Taking into account the commercial and critical successes of the games that were released the previous year, Konami would decide to give the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles another console outing. Whilst the beat-em-up genre had always fit the Turtles franchise like a glove, like the Turtles themselves, beat-em-ups was a game and genre that was beginning to lose some popularity in favour of the more strategic and competitive versus fighting game entertainment medium. Street Fighter 2 and its innovations had popularised the gameplay style, which had led to various other developers taking inspiration from the Capcom classic by releasing their own fascinating takes on the versus fighter. Turtles Tournament Fighters was a group of games that were hoping to capitalise off of what was left of the Turtles brand's popularity by combining it with gamers' love for fighting games. After all, 2 plus 2 equals 5, so Konami were hoping for some great synergy here. Apart from the games being the first Turtles games of their kind, there was a further element that was implemented which developers thought would further separate tournament fighters from the pack, and this element was the title's source material. With Turtles being such a big franchise, by 1993 there were various different Turtles storyline canons that each had their own universes and characters. For example, we had the animated TV show, the movies, and of course the comic books, which I touched on earlier. These all told the Turtles story in their own ways, and each even featured some unique characters which were exclusive to each universe. In fact, speaking of the comic books, the franchise's popularity would even lead to two separate comic book series, even being on the market simultaneously at one point, one series by Mirage Studios, another by Archie Comics, with both having their own separate universes. Story-wise, what made the Tournament Fighters games so different to everything that came before it was that it would mix a roster of fighters from a selection of these universes, which would have meant that fans who were currently only familiar with the movies and animated series for example, may have had their interest piqued to check out the comic books after playing the game. There was potential for this project to result in a lot of cross-pollination for the Turtles brand. So now we have got all that out of the way, and we have a little more context surrounding the game's releases, let's begin checking each title out. Out of the three titles, the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive versions of Turtles Tournament Fighters saw simultaneous releases offering vastly different gameplay experiences. Let us begin by talking about the Super Nintendo game, the best-selling version of Tournament Fighters. The cover art of this game features Donatello facing off against Amargan, a character we shall touch on shortly. 
like many fighting games, the story of Turtles Tournament Fighter focuses around a fighting tournament, which is obviously made abundantly clear in the game's actual bloody title. When the game is powered on, a cutscene is shown, featuring the Turtles watching TV coverage of the tournament being organised, including the announcement that Shredder is entering. Due to these events unfolding, the Turtles 2 decide to enter the tournament to both prove their own strength and to stop their nemesis. In fact, this opening scene also features the Turtles agreeing that they are each going to individually try their best to win the tournament, and announcing it will be nothing personal if they have to face off against each other, straight away presenting an actual story reason for good guys to fight good guys within the game, which is a nice little touch. Once starting a play through, the players get to choose from a selection of 10 different fighters, each of which we shall cover in more detail shortly. A cutscene is shown before the first fight, featuring April O'Neil announcing that the winner of the tournament will receive more money than they can possibly imagine. In terms of a game's story and characters, we will look at both in a moment in more detail, but first let's talk about Tournament Fighter's actual fighting game mechanics. Like Street Fighter 2 before it, this Turtles game features combat that takes place in two out of three false encounters, an element by this point that had become a trope within the fighting game genre. The title takes advantage of the Super Nintendo's button layout, and as a result features a four button control scheme. Similarly to many fighting games published before it, the button layout allows gamers to perform strong and weak attacks. The four buttons are for a weak and strong punch and a weak and strong kick. Like many fighters, there are additional layers of gameplay that add to the overall strategy. For example, it is possible to execute super special attacks. These are only performable via filling up the green mutagen meters that are located directly below the player's life bars. The green meters fill up when a player manages to hit an opponent. Once the meter is full, the super moves are easy to execute with a simple press of both strong attack buttons simultaneously. This simple intuitive system helped make this Super Nintendo game accessible for all gamers alike, an element that not all fighting games can present to the player. I am looking at you, the failure of Street Fighter 3. In terms of the gameplay, players also have the option of choosing which speed to play the game with, which allows players to choose how intense or difficult a playthrough actually is, thus catering to both beginners and experienced fighting game players alike. The characters in the game have distinctive move sets, which complement the overall experience the game delivers. Each fighter's overall attack range is similar, but the player's special moves are enough to give each character an acceptable amount of diversity. The stages each also have their own unique backdrops that add to the game's ambience. All around, the Super Nintendo version of Tournament Fighters is a decent little fighting game, so let's look at the lineup of fighters this game has on offer. Out of the 10 selectable characters, obviously 4 of those are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles themselves, who I am sure you already know plenty about already. So with this in mind, let's focus on the other 6 fighters this game presents us with. Firstly, we have a character known as Wingnut, a humanoid alien bat who appeared in several issues of the Archie comic series, as well as in an episode of the 1987 animated series. Further from this, we have Cyber Shredder. This is Shredder's first appearance in a video game where instead of being a boss, he is one of the lineup of playable characters. Shredder's costume in the game is based off of his appearances within the Mirage comic book series. The name Cyber Shredder had previously popped up in the Game Boy game Radical Rescue, where Shredder became a cybernetic being. However, there is no evidence of this being the case within Tournament Fighters. Next up, we have Chrome Dome an android character who was created exclusively for the animated TV series. Chrome Dome was created by Shredder specifically to annihilate the turtles. Amargan, a mutant shark from the future who is seen on the game's box art, is also a playable fighter within this game. This is yet another character who came from the Archie comic book series. We also have War, a huge purple creature with monstrous claws who features as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the Archie comics. Finally, from the initial selectable lineup of fighters, we have Asuka, probably the most mysterious fighter in the whole game. Whilst every other fighter mentioned so far has appeared in previous Turtles material, Asuka on the other hand made her first appearance in this game. There were several theories as to why this was the case. This includes the introduction of a character who would simply be more marketable to Japanese consumers, with the Japanese version of the sprite showing more arse cheek than that of the Western counterpart. In 2010, though, an early beta version of the game was discovered without Asuka included in the lineup. 
After some data mining, it appears that an early build of the character was hidden in the game's code, in which she was instead named Mitsu. This is significant on the basis that Mitsu was a character from the third Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live-action movie, but it is rumoured that her name was changed in the game to distance the title from the film's terrible reputation. In fact, if you want to learn more about this debacle, fantastic YouTuber Justin Wang has uploaded a whole video covering just Asuka. Quirky stuff, eh? In regards to the characters who do not appear on the initial player select screen, we have a few more to cover. We have a purple turtle known as Fake Brother. Players take on Fake Brother at the Sky Palace in a sort of mirror match. The character is literally a purple palette swap of whichever turtle the player chooses in the game story mode. So not much really to say about this one. The game also features two boss characters, the first of which is the Rat King. The Rat King is a deranged man who cast away his humanity and considered himself a rat even though he has not been mutated. The Rat King was a character who was popular enough to appear in both the comic book series, the animated TV show and multiple video games too. The game's final boss fight takes place against Karai, who is represented differently across various Turtles media sources. In some cases, she is depicted as closely related to the villain Shredder, as his adopted daughter or biological granddaughter. However, in her original comic incarnation, Karai was completely unrelated to Shredder and was actually higher in the Foot Clan's global hierarchy, which would explain her position as the final enemy to defeat in this title. Within the story mode of a Super Nintendo game, she kidnaps both Splinter and April O'Neil to avenge Shredder. Once defeated, the game features different endings depending on which character you play through as, much like many other fighting games, even those released right up until this very day. The game would receive rave reviews from game publications of the time, with the majority of journalists loving this simple fighting game. GamePro would give the game a perfect score, summarising, you want Street Fighter action? Without Street Fighter 2, he's a serious Street Fighter 2 clone that can bring street snobs as well as fledgling fighters out of their shell. Nintendo Magazine UK would love the title too, stating, Who said turtles are old hat? The half-shelled ones deserve respect for being hottest contenders for Game of the Year 1994. Game players would add to the praise too, confirming that the turtles are all grown up, but still looking for a good brawl. The Snares version gives you 10 fighters to the Genesis 8, and its graphics are much better too. There's one clear winner even before the fighting starts. So that was the Super Nintendo version of the game, but as I said, this was just one of the three titles named Turtles Tournament Fighters. Released on the exact same day was the Mega Drive version of the game, which featured Triceraton on the box art, a character who was not even in the Super Nintendo version of the game. When I mentioned that these are completely different games, I was not at all exaggerating. The game emphasises this point instantly by opening up with an introductory scene depicting a completely different story to the Super Nintendo title. The scene opens up by showing four purple doppelgangers of the turtles similar to Fake Brother. They have kidnapped Splinter on Krang's behalf. The story of this game features the turtles teaming with further allies to trek across the galaxy in search of Splinter. Like the Super Nintendo game though, Karai holds the role of the final boss encounter. After it later unfolds that she was the mastermind behind the whole plot. Changes do not just end with the story though. The game features a different combat system, this time bespoke for a controller with a free button layout. Each button is assigned to a different command. In this game's case, a punch button, a kick button and a taunt button. Combining the taunt button with the tap of a specific direction on the D-pad allows characters to perform desperation attacks when their health is low, a feature taken straight from some of SNK's most recent fighting games. In further regards to the gameplay, stronger punches and kicks can also be performed by holding the directional pad towards the opponent when attacking. The special move meter from the SNES version of the game is absent in this one, changing the dynamic of the whole game, especially when you bring desperation moves into the equation too. Aside from the purple turtle doppelgangers, there are 10 fighters in this game. This obviously includes the four turtles and Karai once more, however the other fighters were not in the Super Nintendo version, so let's cover them. Amongst these we have KC Jones, a sports equipment themed vigilante and an ally of the Ninja Turtles. He is often represented as best friends and rivals with Raphael, and romantically linked with April O'Neil. 
we have Triceraton, a member of an alien race who resembles an anthropomorphic Triceratops and are villains from the various forms of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles media. We have a franchise favourite too in the form of Krang, who is the disembodied brain of an evil alien warlord from another dimension and a major antagonist across the canons. The game also features two bizarre characters who appear to be exclusive to this game. They are both presented as allies to the turtles. The first of these is Ray Fillet, a mutant manta ray, and the second is Sisyphus, who is a mutant beetle ally. The final character we need to cover is April O'Neil, who is playable in this one, hilariously dressed as Blaze Fielding from Streets of Rage, which I think is great for the Sega version of the game. Further from these changes, the game also offers a ridiculous tournament mode where players must defeat 88 opponents with just one life bar. Mad. So considering the game features a different story, different characters and completely different mechanics to the Super Nintendo game, you can see that these two titles are very different games. As you can see from this video, the Mega Drive version of the game is not quite as beautiful as the Super Nintendo offering. In fact, personally, I do not think anything about this game is in the same league as a Nintendo title. But what did journalists in the day think? Let's find out. Me Machines would summarise that it does not even begin to scale the same Street Fighter 2 pinnacle, but offers some fast fighting action and a new game direction for the terrible Terrapins although some gameplay flaws exist. Power Unlimited, which I guess is probably a magazine owned by Emperor Palpatine, stated that the Sega version of Tournament Fighters is dramatically worse than that of the SNES. This is mainly due to the creaky graphics and the stiff controls. Electronic Gaming Monthly would add to the criticism, stating, Oh no, what happened to this one? The Super NES version was excellent, but this one isn't even close. There aren't many moves and the fighters are unappealing. The game also has a darker look and feel. So from all of this, as you can see, the Mega Drive or Genesis version of the game certainly did what Nintendo don't, and that was to deliver owners of their system a lackluster game to play in comparison. The final version of the game would see release on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The 8-bit version of the game would only see release in the West, bypassing Japan altogether and in 1994 it would be the last ever NES title to see release in PAL regions. The game's storyline is more rudimentary than the other two installments, and simply revolves around Shredder challenging the turtles to a battle, forcing them to fight amongst themselves and their allies to prove who is worthy enough to fight him. This title holds the distinct appeal of being one of the few fighting games on the platform, which makes a lot of sense considering they were popularised during the 16-bit era, so games this late in the NES's lifespan were rare. This version only features seven characters who consist of the four turtles, Shredder, KC Jones, and exclusive to this version of the game, Hothead. Originating from the comics, Hothead comes to be due to a former fireman unwittingly unleashing an ancient samurai dragon spirit. This samurai spirit is of course Hothead. Graphically, the game looks as crude as you would expect from an NES title, with sprites that look similar to the previous Konami NES beat-em-ups. Like in other tournament games, victory is achieved in two out of three falls encounters via hitting opponents and depleting their life bars. Due to the NES's two-button layout, the game is more simplistic than ever when it comes to the title's controls, and the turtles themselves are just palette swaps of one another. The limited controls meant that Konami developers would introduce yet another way to perform super moves. In this game's case, Splinter's face will sometimes appear on a floating monitor that will drop a Red Bull power-up in the middle of the stage that can be retrieved by either fighter. Collecting the ball will allow the character to utilise their super move by inputting the appropriate command, which will at that time also free the ball to be used again by either player. The game received an average response from journalists, with some leeway being given due to the fact that the game was on an 8-bit platform. GamePro stated, Konami's latest dip into the sewers of Manhattan produces a workable NES fight, but it comes up a tad murky. Yanking the turtles weapons definitely makes them lose some bite. Either you gotta love them turtles, or you must really need an NES fight to get into this cut. EGM would comment, even with just two buttons, there were plenty of special moves, but a lot of breakup and flicker. Megalode would conclude with, 
All in all, Konami could certainly have done the conversion better. The boys are technically better, as they have already impressively demonstrated with the NES version of Bucky O'Hare. This module is also good for a bit of a moody fighting fun. The release of Turtles Tournament Fighters games pretty much marked the end of the classic era of the Turtles, an era in which they were the most popular children's superheroes around. Around this very same period, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers would take the franchise's throne around the world as the most popular children's show, with a merchandising empire as powerful as any. I personally think that none of the versions of the game sold as well as Konami would have hoped. Not only was Turtles an aging franchise, but the fighting game genre was becoming a bit oversaturated in itself as well, so the game certainly would have been a hell of a lot more popular if it saw released two years earlier perhaps. Despite all of this though, the version of the game on the Super Nintendo was a decent farewell to the franchise in the 16-bit era, and the game still has its fair share of fans today. You could even argue that the simplistic, intuitive gameplay the title presented was an early example of the gameplay style that would become more popularised as years went on. All three tournament fighters bring something slightly different to the table, and although they are all very different games, some of them far from perfect, they all have a place in the hearts of many 90s children. If there is one thing that has been abundantly made clear with gamers over the last decade or two, it is that many of us continue to pine for the glory days of the 8 and 16 bit eras, or golden age of the arcade. This means that in today's world, new video games are regularly released that cater to such a market. But back in the days when big tech were yet to identify such a gap, it was solely up to fans and indie developers to deliver experiences that would give gamers a break from the usual Xbox and PS2 modern nonsense. In 2003, Senile Team would give us Beats of Rage, a fan-made tribute game to Streets of Rage that supplants the original graphics and characters with resources taken from the King of Fighters. To Senile Team's shock, their free-to-play game would quickly be downloaded over a million times, despite news of the game only spreading by word of mouth. The game demonstrated early on how hungry gamers have become for beat-em-ups of old, with the AAA games industry completely ignoring the genre as if it had never existed, nor being popular in the first place. Beats of Rage would lead to the existence of software that would change the world of beat-em-ups forever, with the eventual release of Open Beats of Rage, an open source continuation of the Beats of Rage engine that allows fans and developers to make their own beat-em-ups and even games from other genres. After continuous refinement, today Open Bore is often advertised as the ultimate 2D engine and the most powerful 2D sprite based engine in the world. The royalty free software would open the door for all sorts of possibilities along with various new games and fan projects. Merso X, a dedicated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, whose game we shall be providing coverage on today, was one of the many people who would discover and utilise the wonders of Open Bore. During the past few years, he has developed several retro-styled video games for the PC, but it is of course his Turtles work that we are focusing on and showcasing today. Merso states that his original root inspiration behind such a project comes from playing Super Mario All-Stars when he was younger. This was the first time for him and many others where he would see an 8-bit video game get a re-release with music and graphical updates. Ever since that day, he dreamed of seeing every NES game receive a SNES-style do-over. This would, many years later, lead to Merso using Open Bore to begin to create a 16-bit looking remake of the NES game Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project, then later Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. But eventually, this would all become something much bigger and more ambitious. Rescue Palooza! Early on in this process, he notes that for characters that appeared in the original NES games, like the Turtles themselves, he would take the original sprites and recolor and edit them in Photoshop. This painstakingly meticulous process was key in maintaining the integral look and feel of the original games, while simultaneously being able to represent each character in a 16-bit art style. While partaking in the laborious endeavour of remaking games, Merso would of course naturally begin to intensely scrutinise the original Turtles game more and more, like many of us taking note of small discrepancies between the titles and other Turtles lore. 
It was through this process of overanalyzing everything that he would make the extremely bold decision that rather than faithfully remastering the titles, he wanted to take the games in his own direction, attempting to create a gameplay experience that would surpass the originals. Merso states, I wanted to have some flexibility in terms of enemy placement and behavior, but I knew that if I were to take liberties, the game would stop being a faithful adaptation of the originals. So to make it more fun for myself development wise, I decided to use the original games just as a template while creating essentially a new game. For this brave new approach, Merso would attempt to take inspiration not only from all of the classic Turtles games, but also further inspiration from the television animated series too. He would call on the help of huge Ninja Turtles fans including retro toy blogger Eric Zetsky and Suaden John Zelenak, the man with the world's largest Turtles toy collection. Both would assist with implementing accurate Turtles lore elements into the game, as well as helping with the title's story. While as mentioned earlier, many sprites for the game would be created by editing the original sprites in Photoshop. Many sprites for this game would need to be created differently though, since it encompasses a much larger portion of the Turtles universe of characters than any previous games. To help achieve this, Merso X would bring together a team of volunteers to assist with the now huge project, who would do things such as adapt sprites from non-related titles, such as Sunsoft's Batman, and alter them into Turtles characters. In the end, many sprites for the game would just end up needing to be drawn from scratch, taking inspiration from the animated show. This proved to be the most simplistic process, even when it came to creating sprites of Turtles Tournament Fighters characters for the game. So by June the 13th, 2019, the project was finally finished and released for free on Merso X's website, for the world to experience. On the site, the game is described as a free fan-made beat-em-up game based on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. An update and homage to the classic NES titles, with tons of characters playable for the first time. So now, let us together explore the finished product that is available for all now to experience. The game features a very simplistic yet perfectly adequate introductory sequence that features the turtle skateboarding through a wall with it then panned into the game's title. The game's main story mode, which is the first thing initially available to players, can be played up to four gamers cooperatively. Every player is automatically assigned a turtle each, however they can switch characters as they progress, which we shall get to talking about shortly. Upon starting out in this mode, players are made to play through a short tutorial section where, down in the sewers, Splinter explains to the turtles how to use their arsenal of moves. Personally, I do not feel this section is necessary, as the game is simplistic enough that players should be able to work out the controls on their own. Especially when you consider that the kind of people who would likely want to play a game like this are veteran gamers who are highly experienced with both the turtles and beat em ups anyway. But I guess at least players are 100% guaranteed to understand the controls from the get go. Once through the tutorial, we get a humorous cutscene that is depicted in a fateful art style to the original games where Splinter on a television set mentions that to commemorate 30 years of their rivalry, he has gone to the effort of kidnapping literally everyone the Turtles know, presenting the player with the goal of rescuing everyone, leading to a full-on rescue palooza, hence the name of the game. Past this point, fans are greeted with a very familiar setting paired with equally familiar music. Players find themselves on an overworld map that has been based on the overworld found in the original 1989 NES game. In Rescue Palooza, this features as a Mega Man style level select, allowing gamers to play the stages in any order they like, instantly bringing something brand new to the turtles table. You will notice that when you select a stage, say April's building for example, you have the option to switch your character, playing as any turtle you like. This character selection though comes further into play as we progress through the game, which I shall lay more out on shortly. Once action commences you will notice that this stage has been adapted straight out of the second Turtles NES game, however the building is not on fire this time around. Within the stage familiar enemies return as well as new ones servicing too. The stage paired with the accompanying music is dripped in nostalgia. Like in Turtles 2 at the end of the stage April is trapped in the corner, but a mechanical drill soon comes up through the floor leading to a boss fight. Rather than taking on just one boss, this time the turtles take on both members of the gruesome twosome, 
Rocksteady and Bebop. However, in a convention typical of this fan game, after the fight the title subverts the audience's expectations. And not in a lame Last Jedi kind of way, what a horrible film that was. Basically, Shredder emerges from the drill, but instead of managing to capture April like he achieves in the original, this time round she manages to successfully fend the villain off. Because I guess she would have looked like a complete idiot if she managed to get caught in the same situation twice. This leads to one of Rescue Palooza's coolest features of all, and that is that after players complete each stage in the game, new fighters are unlocked to play as. In this level's instance, April herself, along with both Rocksteady and Bebop, become playable. The three new fighters players get for just beating this stage is only one example of the beyond generous amount of extra unlockables that this love letter to the Turtles offers. Upon selecting the next stage you want to play on the overworld map, each of the new fighters are instantly playable on the character select screen prior to action in each level unfolding. On this screen you will also note that every fighter has varied strengths and weaknesses resulting in differences between them away from just aesthetics. In total the game offers a huge variety of stages to play and an incredible 60 different characters to both experiment with and play as. The scope on offer with this one is truly ridiculous in terms of different elements pulled in from across the Ninja Turtles universe. Encounters with enemies at times are even accompanied by voice clips taken directly from the TV show further emphasising that vintage Ninja Turtles feel. Throughout a playthrough you will notice so many references to the cartoon series, the original games and the toy line. So many that by this point it is difficult to even keep up with them all. That much Turtles lore was crammed into just this one fan game. In terms of the stages we get to experience, there are constant moments that will surprise you, with one of my favourite implementations being that Merso X managed to achieve the impressive feat of cohesively marrying up elements from the original 1989 Turtles side-scrolling platforming game with a range of Turtles NES beat-em-up elements. This means that on occasion we get to play through platforming style stages from the NES original, such as when we play through a sewer section of the game. But again, things happen that are completely different from the norm, such as when we get to take on the pizza monster at the end of the stage, a boss who certainly was not present in the 1989 console classic. The constant mixing up of familiar backdrops to create something new is one of the main appeals of this game to me. For example, one moment you may find yourself choosing to play the Key West stage from the Manhattan Project, discovering all sorts of new elements, to the next instance be playing the snow-covered park stage, which was previously exclusive to Turtles 2 Arcade for the Nintendo 8-bit platform. The game consistently nods to the source material it was gaming-wise based upon, but never stops introducing further elements celebrating the Turtles franchise. In terms of more elements that were made bespoke for this game, you can on occasion take out enemies who arrive in vehicles, then take control of said vehicles yourself. Think of this as exactly the same as the rideable steed mechanic that can be found in Golden Axe, a very similar feature that was added to this game by allowing players to ride these mechanical objects. In terms of combat, which is mentioned in the game's tutorial, I would say it is certainly stronger than any that can be found in the actual NES original games. However, it does not feel quite as fluid as the likes of Turtles in Time or the Hyperstone Heist. Characters can do most things you expect, walk, run, jump or attack. However, special moves are possible too with a simple tap of a button when the special move meter is filled up. These meters slowly refill after each use. In terms of the 60 playable characters, some are certainly more functional than others, and I would not call the lineup exactly balanced. However, personally, I find this modern obsession with balancing characters in games and making them all equal a bit over the top anyway. Life is not fair or balanced, so why should our games be that way? Give me some overpowered fighters and some interesting lame ducks any day over a selection of fighters where every one of them is at an equal strength. Variety is the spice of life after all. Unless I guess if you live in China and have to live under the CCP. Between certain stages there are bonus sections to play through, which are introduced by Cuddly the Cowlick from the Turtles comic books, a trans-dimensional being who looks like a floating cowhead. 
These stages allow players to earn extra lives, improving the chances of beating the game. Completing Story Mode then unlocks Arcade Mode, a play mode that allows players to play in an arcade style session as any of the 60 fighters in the game, giving gamers plenty of replayability when it comes to this fan made experience. With the title's extreme depth of characters and stages to play through, I could break down and overanalyze every detail in this video forever. However, I feel that Rescue Palooza has enough warranted cameos and surprises that I will leave it up to you to explore many of them for yourself. After all, with this being a free to play game, all of you watching today have the opportunity to play this. The game would astound many when it first popped up online, including gaming media sources. So let's check out what they have to say. Retrospect.com stated that the most outrageous thing of all is that TMNT Rescue Palooza is a well-conceived and made game that tugs heavily on all things nostalgic about the heroes in a half shell, yet is completely free to boot. It's a passion project that's sure to make you relive and re-experience the joys of your youthful interests. The game is most definitely a love letter that is written both to and from the fans. Kotaku would add... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Rescue Palooza has it all. Foot Soldiers, The Party Wagon, Lesser Known Mutant Antagonist, Ground Chuck and Dirtbag. And best of all, the fan-made PC game is free to download. Den of Geek would praise the game, relating it to the market needing more quality beat-em-ups in 2019, stating... There's never enough modern games in the genre on the market, and there's certainly never enough of them that recreate the surprising quality of so many great Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle beat-em-ups of the past. When it comes to Rescue Palooza, the result is as impressive as it is welcome. Across the board, Rescue Palooza was welcomed and praised by fans and journalists alike. But perhaps without playing this yourself yet, you may be wondering how well this game holds up against the originals. Now after playing all of them, both the original titles and this fan game, it is actually a rather tough question to answer, as although on the surface the game looks very similar, the changes make a big enough difference for Rescue Palooza to feel a bit different from any Turtles games we have played before. I would say overall it feels completely different to the likes of the actual Turtles arcade games and what appeared on the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive with gameplay certainly being framed closer around the trilogy of Turtles games that appeared on the NES. With that said, that's still not completely true though, as while we get plenty of nods in the game to the 1989 original, I would go as far to say that they literally are just that, as the game has little mechanically in common with the original title. For example, the overworld map is just a level select in this instance, and we never need to cycle between characters mid-play to strategically make our way through the original game's difficult challenges. So I would say that gameplay-wise, it certainly feels more like Turtles 2 and 3 on the NES rather than anything else. Which makes perfect sense as well, considering in its earliest development stages that those were the games that Merso X was trying to replicate. So the easiest way to describe this game is the greatest ever Turtles 2 and 3 on the NES style Turtles game, if that makes any sense. So to go back to my original question of whether or not that this is better than the originals, well in my opinion I think this game certainly tops Turtles 2 and 3 if you were going to play this one today. But the game is way too different to any of the other Turtles games to even really compare even though there are plenty of nods to them throughout. So, it's better than some of the originals, yet completely different than some of the other originals. Basically, it is the greatest NES-style Turtles beat-em-up, even if the graphics have taken a 16-bit approach this time around. All in all, I am very happy that this amazing game exists, and I urge you all to try it out for yourselves. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Rescue Palooza. Let me know in the comment section if you have any experience with this game and what you thought of it, or if this video was your introduction to the title. What have been your initial impressions? I'd be curious to hear all of your thoughts.
If you enjoyed today's content, then please consider subscribing and checking out my playlist, looking at all of the classic Turtles games. Or if you fancy something different, I have lots of other playlists for you to check out too. Videos like this are made possible in part due to the fact that I can work full time on YouTube through the help of the people who back this channel on Patreon, receiving videos early, extra bonus content, names in the credits and much more. Speaking of these people, additional thank yous go out to... Sebastian Velez, Carl Johnson, A Murder of Crows, Heyo, Paulo Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Ben Haradine, Corey I. Marsh Sr., Capcom vs. SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinch, Evan Balder, Philip Nanth, Asma Rorakai, Keith Ferguson, Jockin Varela, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, Adriel I-35, Alephia Swanson, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, Joe Bishop, JB, Michael Hall, Wesley Sang E, Wayne Kerr, Langston Miller, Noob, Brian Barry, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Renee, Marvin Liga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Dan Van Dammit, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bale, Chris Fisk, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai, Andrew Bazanski, Gunther Hendricks, and all of my other wonderful patrons. Thank you so much.